so excited and I'm really honored to be here. Um, this is a gathering of your colleagues. It's a, it's a very special kind of event, and I know that. And you're in the process, together and individually, of discovering your vocation, which you, I don't know if you're familiar with Frederick Beckner. He is a, a, an author, a Presbyterian minister, pastor, wonderful philosopher who defines, come on in, defines a vocation the best way that I could ever imagine anybody defining it. Because he says, your vocation is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. I love that. Because, you know, it's when you know you've got it. But that sense of uh, a vocation. So well, I, I still can't quite believe that I have been teaching college students how to speak well and remember, negative models are also very powerful, right? So that's a that sense of intimidation when I say, well, I'm teaching other people how to speak well. Sometimes I don't quite nail it myself. <laughs> it's been 36 years. I just want you to, to imagine that I came in as a child prodigy right, into, the, uh, into the academy. Uh, how lucky am I, right, to have been able to do that and to still be doing it? Uh, just every day, it's kind of goosebumpy. Uh, ever since I began that journey, and since it was given to me by my kindred spirit in graduate school at the University of Washington, I've kept within viewing distance an inspirational passage that, that my friend gave me. It's purportedly from a personal journal that John Steinbeck, and I hope you love John Steinbeck, right? The author. Uh, he supposedly kept this journal personal journal while he was writing his masterpiece, The Grapes of Wrath. And this is his description of his high school economics teacher, Ms. Hawkins. This is what he says about her. She aroused us to shouting, book-waving discussions. Our speculation ranged the world. She breathed curiosity into us so that we brought in facts or truths shielded in our hands like captured butterflies. She loved a passion in us for the pure, knowable world, and she inflamed me with a curiosity which has never left me. She left her signature on us, the literature of the teacher who writes on minds. I've had many teachers who taught me soon forgotten facts, but only three who created in me a new hunger, a new thing, a new attitude. I suppose that to a large extent, I'm the unsigned manuscript Deathless power lies in the hands of such a person. And I love that. That's, that was, that's a teacher I still want to be when I grow up, right? It's kind of like an academic superhero. And I keep having to remind myself that surely Miss Hawkins couldn't always have been on that mountaintop, right? She had to have been in the valley uh, where many of us spend, you know, our, our, a lot of our time in the classroom is kind of that emotional roller coaster, I think. Um, and so uh, it's still extremely in inspirational to me. And there's another inspiration for me. Back when he was still funny, Woody Allen uh, <laughs> once said something that I have always thought applied as well to teaching and learning as it does to romance. So this is his uh, best pitch picture of award winning Annie Hall. Okay, This is a, a quote from that movie. And in there, he's talking about the breakup of the relationship. You know, a relationship is like a shark. It has to keep moving forward or it dies. In that case, he's describing his breakup. He's saying, I think what we got in our hands here is a dead shark. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to kind of link this to Parker Palmer, the last of my, my, my inspirational mentors, uh, who many of you may know, the acclaimed educational philosopher, ethicist, and writer. It reminds us that a classroom is a space in which the community of truth is practiced. A community of truth that's rich and a complex network of relationships. So you see where I'm kind of trying to tie in the notion of it's about nurturing and creating and developing relationships in which we must both speak the truth and listen, make claims on others, and make ourselves accountable. As teachers, we kind of tend to think of what we do as independent autonomous. You know, we close the door as between us and our students. And we forget that it takes an entire community of people to successfully educate a whole person on a daily basis. And I think about what went into the summit, all the people that had to be involved in making this a success. But help me out here. Think about who are all the people, you know, in the schools that you, you know, the school you're in now, the school that you've been uh, uh, observing, 
uh, in this school if you want to. You've got you, you've got students, you've got fellow teachers. Who else does it take, role by role, like the roles of the people? Parents. Okay, parents. Other people who make it happen on a daily basis. Bus drivers. Bus drivers. Custodians, and thank you for saying that because I just I wanted to share with you. This did not come from a one-on-one -on -one relational interview, but okay. um, raise your hand if you enjoy cleaning your own toilet. Okay. Raise your hand if you would think you'd enjoy cleaning public toilets for a living. And that's why I appreciate our custodians here so much because of what they do for us and how they really, you know, if, if we don't have this, if, we, if they don't do what they do, nobody wants to come here. Nobody wants to be here. Um, and they're such an important part of, of this community, but they kind of tend to go under the radar. And um, I, I had conversations, several wonderful conversations with Dale Waller, who was one of the custodians who works in the third floor of Barnes and Sciences building. And he won in the Garden Club the Garden of the Month Award. And this is a big deal. This is our local, from our local paper, the reporter. Right? So I saw this and I was so proud. And I, you know, I was just, it was so neat. This is our Mr. Waller at the Garden Club of the Month, right there in, in, the, uh, in the paper. Why, what does it have to do with, with, with the community organizing kind of tool that I'm about to, you know, we're about to start actually practicing in here? I now know that Mr. Waller is a master gardener. And so he and I have been talking about rain now. We've been talking about, you know, what are those bag worm things? How do you get rid of them? So now I have this relationship with someone that is actually helping me in my own life. And I also know that in the future, when there's something that comes up here at school that has to do with in, in, improving the aesthetic quality of this place, I've got Mr. Waller. He's got my back. He's an advocate. He's a fellow advocate. And I now have that relationship. And I will use that relationship. If and when, right? I think that there's a project that would improve the public good here. Right? And I know that Mr. Waller has a stake in and some expertise in. And that's what the one-on-one -on -one relational interview is. It's a tool, right? Uh, that, that just because of the way it's framed comes from the community organizing folks, the people that really do politics the way it should be, which is, you know, ordinary citizens kind of thinking about how, what are the things that we need to do in our community, and how do we get people together that come from different backgrounds, and have different self-interests. How do we all get on board this? Well, you, in that school, right, we just named a few of those schools, there are lots of others. When you start to think about all the people that are stakeholders in your school, and how the more you know about what their interests are, and their backgrounds, the better you're able to be, you know, to, to, to use them, and I mean that in the most genuine sense of the words. It's about strategic kind of developing relationships because you really do want to use that in uh, furthering what you believe to be a public good, think a project that you think is, is good for the, for the school. So whether it's, or the community, it's developing a public pool, or whether you think you got a great idea for a new field trip place we should go to, or a new tutoring project that we should start, you know, or a new curriculum that you wish we'd kind of get on board with, then the one-on-one -on -one relational interview is a way for you right, to sit down and really pick the brain of the people that are going to need to be on board with that, right, in your community. And that's why it's such a, it's a kind of a, a powerful tool. So, uh, we're about to, to do it, and what the handout is that I gave you right, is kind of the, uh, a little bit about what it's for, and then tips on how to do it, and then we're actually going to get to it. Right? So, again, purpose. It's a, it's a way to find out what you have in common with other people in your community that you have identified as people that you either have a stake in or have power related to what it is that you are interested in. And you want to know how to leverage that self-interest of theirs into a commitment to help accomplish a public goal. So it's very much a public relationship. Okay. Uh, and I, I want to talk a little bit about setting it up. You know, what do you do? Depending on who it is, you might just walk into their office, depending on where you can find them. You might oftentimes just end up picking up the phone. And it's a kind of a cold call situation lots of times. Right, and you're thinking about who they are. 
fact, you haven't had a lot of interaction or any with them. But it amounts to kind of saying, hey, Max? Mm -hmm. sure. Jan Clark, we haven't met, but I have heard you're doing really great work uh, over there at your school. And I was wondering if you have an hour time that, uh, you know, maybe I can pick your brain, we can talk about it. That might be convenient. I don't know what he's going to say. He might say, yeah, I'd love to. He might say, I don't know, let me check my calendar, let me get back to you. But it's that simple in terms of, it's really about, I, I just really would like to spend a half an hour with you. And one of the keys to this is that it needs to be short, no more than half an hour. You don't do this for more than half an hour. Uh, you may reschedule and do it again, um, but it's a, a short and kind of sweet process. And it's an interview. It's not an interrogation. So it has to be something that feels natural, somewhere that you can kind of, you know, be be able to take yourself away from distractions, and you have to feel comfortable in your role as really wanting to pull information out of that other person and not feeling like you have to talk as much or more as them. And that, you know, is a skill. So here's what I want to I want to ask you to tell me right now before we actually start practicing this in any way, because it's a, you know listening is a complex skill. And it takes a while to get comfortable and good at doing it. But tell me, just because you have been doing it, you're performing it beautifully now, by the way. Right? You're looking like you're absolutely intrigued. <laughs> Luckily, I can't, I don't know what's going on in the mind. That's the beauty of listening. It's really kind of a performance, but it is more than that. How do you know you're being listened to? You tell me. What are the things that people do or don't do that make you feel as if you're getting listened to? Let's just see what we can come up with. Okay. okay, looking at you, so, okay, so we'll keep going. Following. Okay, that sense of following you. Yes, questions. Okay. And questions that are kind of follow-up, that keep probing, right, that, that take it back to, to what you were talking about. Good. What else makes you feel like you're being listened to or makes you feel like you're not being listened to? You mean just like facial expressions, like what you know, just a smile or something like that, like that they're also interested in what you're saying? Yeah, it's, it's the eyes of the window to the soul, but it's also the, it's the softness of the face, an open kind of a, an expression, something that's not tense or, uh, or worried, but, but soft and open, good. What else makes you feel like you're being listened to? Appropriate facial expressions too, like if you're telling a sad story, but you're the person smiling, like yeah. <laughs> they probably weren't listening. Yeah, yeah. It's let your body respond, which is something it's harder to do the less time we actually spend looking at each other on a daily basis because we kind of forget to use those muscles. Right? But it's really important in the one on one. Anything else you can think of that, that really helps you feel like you're being listened to? That somebody else does in the end. Body orientation, where, where is it? Okay, kind of more or less one-on-one. -on -one. And of course, those of you that, that study gender communication know, right, <laughs> that frequently there's a difference in, in how girls and boys are socialized. So that you guys are much more generally, all things being equal, you're more comfortable doing that and talking to each other. And it might be very intimately, but side by side. And we've kind of grew up knowing, no, this is how we establish that closeness. So sometimes we think guys aren't listening just because of that body orientation. It's not necessarily true at all, but it's fascinating. You know, it's kind of socialization differences. I don't want to overgeneralize, but still, that notion that you kind of want to be leaning in and towards. Okay, good. Because that's what I want you to practice, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of part of the key, is, is setting the environment. And this room is perfect for it, all right? And uh, if you look at the handout I gave you, kind of just a, Three pages and then the reflection sheet. Just remember, this is strategic. So, the first page is kind of another way of, of orienting you to the, 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 the background. Okay. Uh, and it is about getting information, so it is strategic. Okay. You want to, to try to pick their brain, draw them out as much as you can. And then that second page there, kind of some general tips for what kinds of questions and how you ask them and what you're doing with your face and body are likely to, uh, to elicit the best kinds of, of responses. So direct, open-ended, silent, you know, let's get comfortable with silence so that you invite them to keep responding. All those listening behaviors we talked about, uh, following up with, uh, 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 so if I got that right, it sounds like something that you were 
kind of frustrated with the time, is that right? So you're doing that probing to make sure you check your understanding. You're feeling comfortable asking follow-up questions because they've, they've led you in a, in a really interesting direction. And you're, you're keeping track of the time so it doesn't go over half an hour because it might be just rolling right along. And that's, you know, you're tempted to go on, but you really don't want it. You don't want to say, this is great. Let's do this again. So, you know, could be. And, and set it up. And then, you know, you may well want to kind of get together on a regular basis if it's somebody that's in your life, if it's somebody whose role is going to be there um, for a while in the institution, the organization, the community that you're in. So, right, the last part of that, which is where we kind of really do get to the, uh, the best, quickest part. So you're, you're trying to get a public relationship you're, you're really focusing on trying to draw out the spirit, the values of the other person. You're being very genuine. Uh, it's kind of more than an ordinary conversation. It's not about likes and dislikes. You're, you're trying to kind of get as deep as you can without making someone feel uncomfortable. You have to be genuine and open. You know, you really have to open yourself to that moment instead of kind of thinking ahead or behind. And really be patient. Those sample interview questions are kind of oriented in a way that, that is a nice direction in terms of kind of starting with the background and the kinds of how did you get here and tell me about where you came from. And, and, but notice, you'll notice that uh, most of these really are kind of about being able to identify interests and concerns and inspirations. So they're, they're good ways to, to leave it open enough but still get you what you want. And when you're done, this is where the reflection sheet comes in. You want to, you don't want to, you know, it's not an interrogation, so you're not sitting there taking notes, right? You really want to be in that moment with that person. But as soon as you're done, you want to, before you forget, okay, write down the contact information. Because remember, this is somebody you want to cultivate. This is somebody that you want to work with again in the future. and. Make sure you get kind of an accurate summary of what did I learn about them. You know, what do I think are their special skills and, and uh, background and interests that I could draw on? What else did I learn about them? And what did I find out we had in common? Because that's, you know, that's really a key element to uh, nurturing and developing a relationship. So that's, you know, that's a tool. I want you to just have a chance to learn something about each other in a one-to-one -one relationship, a uh, relational interview setting. And we'll do it in any one. And we have just about the right amount of time because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to, to person A and person B, is there anybody you don't know? Nobody knows us. <laughs> <laughs> there are only two of us. <laughs> yeah, this is good, so I'm going to pair you up. Can I pair you two up? Sure. All right. Max, you two, okay. Um, which one of these three people do you not know? Any of them? Okay. Courtney right. and Nicole know each other really well. <laughs> All right, so we can break you guys up. All right, I'll let you pick. Um, pick one of these three people. The, the, the person you know at least. I don't know you. Okay. All right. And you guys know each other really, really, really well? Not really. Yeah, okay, good. All right. So, so all right. if you two <laughs> shift over this corner, all right, this back corner, that's going to be your interview okay. table. Okay. Uh, you two can stay right, how about right here? How about, are you two comfortable going up in this upside right corner? Mm -hmm. And that leads you to, how about shift over here? Sure. 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 Turn to the sample questions just because you want to you know, pick a, a subgroup of them that you're comfortable with. So you're sitting together, you're kind of comfortable. Uh, you're you're gonna uh, by the way, uh, introduce each other name wise. Go ahead and do that so that you can get it. Okay. Now decide which one of you is going to be A and B. Pick an A, pick a B. Got it? All right, so for the next 10 minutes, person A, I want you to conduct a relational one-on-one -on -one interview with person B. 
know what your goal is, right? And you kind of have a good sense of, of how comfortable you want them to be, right? Uh, and what you kind of want to accomplish in this 10 minutes together to be able to, to learn more about what makes them tick, what drives them, what inspires them, what, you know, what gets them up and going. So pick a selection of those questions. Um, just let, be, let it be natural. I will tell you when your 10 minutes is up, and then we'll switch roles. So we'll do two 10-minute interviews. And you may start now. Do you want to get first? Do you want to get first? Do you want to get first? Do you want to Oh, uh, three, two. So it's all the Oh, I went to a I really didn't have a yeah. So I was driving the other day, and I heard on the radio about high school games. Well, technically, there's no so it's like, this different days, I can't remember days now, because then, uh, it costs a couple of days.
was just like, 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 the more I learned how to work with him, the more exciting I saw him. The more excited I saw him with something that's kind of, I was just like, no, this is like a natural. Yeah, like that was the idea. I just want something good. I get this. I just love that. It's kind of, it's kind of all the other things. I went to, um, I think it happens in high school, but it's more I knew that was better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's like in my first middle school, I was kind of like, I don't know what they were 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 like, I don't know what they were
some kind of open there towards I when I was in campus. No, that's So yeah, okay, so you have a switch on. No, that's not really bad. So you want to switch off? Yeah, all right. I don't know if I'm going to follow that. What do you mean? You told me. What do you mean? Like, 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 like